My name is Allison Kuo. I'm from Texas originally, and I live in Brooklyn now, and I make performance art that's very interactive, that deals um, with food and food cultures. Uh, so one of my recent projects, I had a performance at a small gallery in Bed-Stuy, and so it was right across the street from this great like Brooklyn Chinese takeout restaurant, and I photographed the interior of the restaurant, printed those out to recreate that into the gallery, and then I had people buy food from the restaurant during my opening, bring it to me, and then I had all this like fun, like food colored food sprays. It's like food spray paint and glitter and garnishes, and um, I would replate the food for people in the gallery and just kind of give people like a like the sort of like high experience of food that you can have in places like New York where you can pay $500 to have food presented to you in a very artistic way but it, it was you know it was presented in a gallery and it was also um, thinking about something that I'm researching more now which is the way that Chinese restaurants um, in places outside of China really cater to uh, the people in the neighborhood where they're located. So since then I've been to Manchester in the UK and visited Chinese chippies where you can have like uh, salt and pepper french fries basically cooked in a wok and I'm looking to go to other countries and see what they're doing there. I'm Leah Dixon. Um, I am a sculptor and sometimes performance artist, always integrated with making my sculptures. Um, I work on a bunch of different projects at one time, but one that I've been working on a lot recently is where I make two towers, twin towers, and I durationally, as a performance, um, hand saw them apart and I reconstruct them in front of an audience into a new form, kind of giving like the twin towers a different narrative, I guess. Um, which is obviously a very charged situation. And that, I guess I tend to like to work site specifically, so I make those when I'm in New York. And I'll also kind of do the same thing while I'm traveling. I make a lot of work while I travel, where I um, maybe take the form of a very popular monument there and kind of reconfigure that form in a very site-specific manner to sort of insert myself into that monument's history and that culture's history even though it might be kind of touchy. I just like the conversation that it kind of brings about. And also, I think monuments are like a really great way that a lot of people experience art because they're very public and they, take, they are personified. They don't exist on a wall away from you. They're meant to become humanoid where you interact with them and have your own relationship with them. So that is my kind of like personal interest in, in my own practice relating to sculpture. Well, um, my name is Matt Stone, and I'm a sculptor. And uh, right now, I'm exploring uh, uh, 3D printing, um, as well as uh, wood carving using a bandsaw um, and bronze, ca bronze casting. Um, so it's a I, I kind of run the gamut of uh, traditions, but uh, mostly. Um, they are traditional traditions, except for the 3D printing, which is a bit different. Um, uh, right now, I'm uh, focusing on uh, keys as an object, um, as a metaphorical object, um, and as just something that is like a you know a metal that is just so um, like critical for our like daily existence. And you know, I think about like what it means to you know like like have a home or to be home or like to like be led into something or like controlling something with that way. What's really important to me um, is just when I'm working to try and find that like synesthetic place with the object where there's sort of the, the subject object, like there's that oneness when you're making making your work that I, I feel is really satisfying to me. And, is what I look for in my practice. My name's Michelle Segre, and I'm a sculptor. I um, have lived in New York since I was five years old. Um, 
My last couple of bodies of work have been dealing with materials that are um, uh, a bit on the ephemeral side. Um, I've been using bread in my sculptures and other uh, types of dried foods and, um, and experimenting with, with, um, with sealing the uh, bread with uh, a kind of vinyl polymer um, and using it as, as a material, uh, making objects that are, that are um, almost like um, transmitters or receivers of information. So they have a kind of back and forth with the viewer um, and I've also been working a lot with, um, with yarn and wire and string um, to make pieces that have um, uh, kind of um, planes of uh, intersecting planes so that they're, they deal with pictorial space but not um, rather than um, three-dimensional space. And, um, yep, that's about it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pamela Council. Um, I'm a visual artist. I make sculpture and performances. Lately, I've been really into the Devray method of treating velvet. Devray is a, a subtractive process that uses a super basic gel applied to a material, um, a fabric that's got mixed materials. And so I use this process to burn out the velvet. Um, and lately I've been using a lot of text in velvet uh, and I see the surfaces velvet, surface of velvet as similar to skin um, and also as a site that shows a lot of wear. So I'm really interested in like how couch cushions get worn down, how the bottoms of curtains get frayed and putting that kind of trauma into a fabric that I also hang up on the wall. When I hang them on the walls, I use found objects like crack pipes, back scratchers, and other things that people use to give themselves pleasure. Um, and I'm really interested in the pleasure that happens in a domestic space and the self-soothing tools that people use to do that to themselves. I'm really interested in materials that relate to the body and the notion of mortality within my performance. Lately, I've also been working on my will and um, did a performance this summer that was called Is Your House in Order? where I have a conversation with people about their wills and writing their wills as I'm burning out the velvet to reveal my will in white velvet. So now I've got a document in velvet. So Michelle, I'm really interested in this idea of like the transmitter. Yeah. Like this plasticized bread <laughs> being a transmitter. How does that work or how do you see that working with um, the audience? Well, the bread is kind of is 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 dried out and then um, I make holes in it. So you can usually see through the piece of bread or the loaf. Sometimes I'll use a whole loaf. Um, and it's it's um, put together as a very kind of in a very simple way, like there, there'll be like a brick or a stone um, that's the pedestal for the, the slice of bread, you know. Um, so they have this kind of very, they have like a face, you know, like a back and a, and a face. And, um, and I, I've had this idea not just with these bread pieces, but, it, you know, going back to the earliest sculpt sculptures that I've made. Um, just the idea of the object being a kind of, um, almost like a, like a, a living thing that, that gives energy back and forth to the viewer. Whatever that, however that can be interpreted, you know, that, that type of force that. I that, like that idea a lot. It's like I like I feel like that's something that I look for in my work too. Is sort of like to ha like, and I also like the idea of objects as transmitters, as because you know it's sometimes I think about like what happens to an object like when it's like outside of our view, and you can't see it. Sort of like, is it still transmitting like like whatever like cultural significance that 
you know, it had? Like, does it lose that significance, or, um, or uh, does it still transmit that, like, like if there's nobody there to be transmitted to? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. like, like, can you hear the tree fall? Can you hear the tree yeah, yeah. fall? Yeah. The exactly. like, has a song. Yeah. Yeah. A chair is still a chair. Even if there's no one sitting yeah. there. I think I know it. I'll have to listen to that. Yeah, we'll have to do yeah. that later. It's like the exit music. Yeah. I was, in preparing for this, I was thinking about objects because I'm, I was a ceramics artist and a sculptor before starting to work with food a lot, which is a material that will decay. Leah and I had studios near each other in grad school, and she was familiar with the decay process. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I can't keep a lot of the things that I make in and I'm often making things with my audience and that's what I'm most interested in is the, the kind of what thing in the moment that we arrive at together is what they want and what I want to make for them. But I have a studio and I have a lot of sculptural materials and I go there and I make sculpture without the intention of showing it. So it's like, what are those sculptures that I, you know, sometimes they make it out in the world, but a lot of times they're just for me, but they're like, they're communicating with me and I'm thinking through them and then they do exist. I think it's different from material to material and definitely like object to object. So like, it sounds like you're using some pretty charged objects. So it's like... Yeah, I've, I'm using objects that are charged if you know they are. Um, but I, I think all objects are charged because the magic that you're talking about happens from the time of production. So I like have a background in in footwear production. And I used to spend a lot of time in the factories with people handling things. And I think about those people a lot and like how we get the things that we get. Um, and those, those people are the material. Those people are the material. Yeah. And those Part people of them is charged. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those the people object. charge mm -hmm. the works. And the same with the monuments, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about like, if. I have so many things that are in my studio that because I only think that they matter if they're accessible in the way that I want them to be accessible, I actually don't even want someone to look at them inside or inside a white space a lot of times or inside my house because that for me is something that I, um, that I personally want to kind of dispel the myth of the artist as this like elevated maker. The artist is, I think, just a maker as a way to connect to the other makers. So yeah, I mean, that's when you, you like start talking about the object separate from how it got there. That becomes like a really dishonest or a really kind of like easy conversation. It's not collaborative. It kind of allows people to like when you're saying like that's a charged material with the velvet, it's like oh, yeah, I was thinking more of the, that you were finding used cra uh, you found oh, a yeah, used, used crack, crack pipes. pipes. Oh, they're like, not right. used crack pipes. Oh, okay. They're new uh, crack. They're new crack pipes. Okay. Um, There's potential for use. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. I don't use used objects as a rule okay. actually. Mm -hmm. um, like I use crack pipes. I use acrylic fingernails, things that deal with the body. But I don't want people's waste not into skin soil. <laughs> so, it's. I mean, that's a different kind of charge, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I totally knows. didn't understand what you what you were. Yeah, you know, that's a different thing. Yeah. 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 Although it's but still it's a crack pipe. But it's important for us to clarify that, yeah, which totally. is really interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. it's yeah. really I mean, important. It's still I mean, uh, psychologically, it's just totally different. Yeah, like one is the residue of a personal catastrophe, catastrophe like, or, or history, or personal pleasure, history, yeah. and one has. The history of the making, which is a totally different kind of his, it's di but it's also like when you, we talk about the objects collecting um, psychic energy, it's like just a different kind of energy, right? It's like so psychologically, that object is going to feel completely different as a brand new thing, right? That that's full of potential. I think you're, that's interesting when you, to think about in terms of, a, of 3D printing, because that kind of method sort of skips over some of that. It doesn't, like a lot of things we think are, are mass produced, but they are hand produced at some level of their function. But 3D printing is a way to kind of, maybe not totally, but circumvent the hand. Um, yeah, it's, it's really weird because it's, it produces really cold objects. 
and like they're very um, uh, uh, homogenous in material. But I think what's fun about that is really the drawing process. Um, I, I got back into computer drafting um, and I, do, I don't really have like a, like a physical like drawing process or um, practice. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird process. I'm still kind of, I'm still integrating it um, because I think that like there are things that are, that are so foreign about the objects that it produces. Like they're kind of like, kind of alien in a lot of ways. Like figuring out how to deal, deal with it, um, like in, uh, you know, like what the objects are, like what the material is. Um, like I find that, um, you know, I, like I needed to cast um, them in bronze for them to become, actually become like sculptures. Um, they were, before they were really just literally three dimensional drawings to me. Like, and then they, they took objecthood when they translated into a different material. So I thought that was kind of interesting because it was like the information was making a jump like from material to material. And then like the bronze obviously brought a ton of history. And then the, 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 the 3D printing brought all of its strange alien artifacts or sort of like relics that like maybe may have come through a time warp or something because it's like, it's something super ancient and primal and bronze casting uh, and something really just very now and um, uh, computerized with the 3D printing, so. It's very hard for us to relate to robot made things like hearing yeah. you talk about integrating, you know, it's it's tricky. It's really a new it's, process. It's funny, and I mean, it's funny because like the way that I usually make things is by handling them, and by like and like being like here, like with like the object, and like just being like having it be like in my space. So I mean, to have to be like in, you have to like kind of go into the computer and be like really get into the drawing and be like, and then think about it, and then also like take yourself out of it and remember like all of the things that you know in the real world about like what like this thing could become, um, so. But what is the material that, um, that the 3D printer uses? Is it that plastic? Yeah, it's a corn plastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like It's a made from corn? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, I think that's yeah, kind of interesting because then, yeah. like, the molecular structure of the material is is organic. actually organic. It's, it's that's really it's kind weird. of wild. It's weird. That's weird. Yeah. I mean, it's like you know, they're three D printing organs and stuff now, yeah. based upon like, stem cell growth and stuff. Are the like, organs made of corn too? <laughs> no, made, of, made of like. Uh, I think they cells. will be once yeah. they're adopted into yeah. corn-fed yeah. human. Yeah, yeah. 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 corn-fed yeah. human. Yeah. 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 Do, do you still think about objecthood when you think about, you know, a heart transplant or like, a, I don't know, like any like. Is a heart an object? Like breast implants or something like do you think yeah are those okay have you ever heard like like um i know about this because an old friend of mine had a he, he his heart was leaking and he it was like the way he described what was done to his heart was like talking about sculpture it was like they reconstructed a valve they like created a, like a marriage point so there was like a, kind of like a female and a male connector it was just like kind of almost like cabinet making in a way but it, yeah but plumbing or something it's like and it you know it was all done inside of his body and it's now his organ so it's like yeah I think it's this weird kind of thinking about objecthood you can apply that language essentially to everything but it's like what's the things that make us individually yeah connect with that I, yeah, think. Like I think about oh. I mean I think about how our bodies are made out of things all the time like I actually like, will just be like, wow, I really appreciate today how my kidneys worked or <laughs> like, when you, just, when you just think about biologically all of the things that your body has to do so that you can walk around and eat and um, it's amazing. And so like when you isolate it down into like one part or one thing that actually performs a function, it is, it is just a thing that we're lucky to have and lucky that it works. <laughs> it's a little mini machine. 
Yeah. I don't machine. But, yeah. Well, the machines are made to reflect. I don't know. The machines are made to reflect us. Uh huh. Right? External machines. Man made Extra machines. Man made machines. Sort right now. But I don't feel like machines, like, I feel like everyone is constantly, like, comparing computers to, like, people's minds. And I just feel like that's just so wrong in a way. Uh -huh. Everyone's like, oh, your mind is like a hard drive and you've got RAM and you can remember stuff because, and like we're all like on the internet of like connectivity, so like simple talking. Compared but it's like to I just don't. Yeah, but, yeah. but then it's like I mean, well, but then, <laughs> and then I remember like reading about like when you know people used to used to compare human beings to like locomotives and stuff, mm. you know. And it's like I just sort of feel like, you know, we're not like that simple. It's like it's. I think it's really problematic to kind of posit humans as a high performance thing because we don't all perform high. In me no one performs very well in everything. So I think when you start like comparing humans to something that's built to perform the ultimate function in the ultimate manner, that becomes like scary, scary, I think. Well, unless you believe in like mind control. <laughs> yeah. Really, unless you believe that people are being hacked, which is possible, you know, and then the programming of a person like a machine makes sense. Well, well we genetic get... manipulation is here. Yeah, yeah. And, and behavioral patterns. Cultural programming, in a sense. But maybe we'll discover <laughs> True. one day that we're actually much closer to plants than anything else. That would you know? be. Because as research is showing more and more that plants have this kind of um, you know, way to ways to communicate, like trees, if you guys followed any of this stuff about the trees, having their communities where they help each other through by sending nutrients through the, their roots mm, mitochondria. to the ailing tree in the community. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, they so, talk I to mean, each like other. They, yeah, they, they talk to each other. They, they have a support group. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. They, they gossip. I mean, yeah. God knows what they do. Right, I mean, right. really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. But I think it's interesting, right? Because it's like, then you look at a tree or a piece of wood or something, and then you're like, object. And then you're like, and then object is something, an object is usually something that is like, like, you are the subject, like, this is the object. And like, like, I'm going to, like, I'm going to will my control onto this object and like, like, I'm going to, like, complete this task. You know, which is sort of something I like. I try not to do when I'm sculpting. It's like I try not to like. I try to ha like reverse that a little bit. Um, but I think that like I mean that's like the with the heart, right? It's sort of like is a heart an object? What would be like is a piece of fruit an object? Because yeah. like a piece of fruit is like grown without the will of a human becomes a thing. You definitely. I just treat it like yeah. You any definitely. sculptural material. Yeah, fruits are objects. <laughs> yeah. For sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, why not? There's something you're also, when you're talking about turning the um, 3D printed object, like casting it in bronze, I think that's something that I think a lot of artists think about is like how much transformation needs to be done to a material or an idea for us to accept it as an art. Mm -hmm. Like when does it stop being it and when does it become a new art that mm -hmm. exists? Yep. Um, and I think that might be something that's scary about machines is they can do so much without us um, positioning the transformation that it's like hard to accept that I think. Mm -hmm. I could imagine that with like a 3D printing you kind of get this thing and even though you designed it. How is it yours? Right, how, right. Like how does it really like relate to like relate to, to, to like me as an artist or like or like another or another person as a as like a viewer, mm -hmm. and not just be like this alien, like object. We're, I mean, it's the alienness is sort of cool about it. And it's interesting. Michelle and I um, have a studio together, in, or we sh we share a space. And um, there was one incident where you had emailed me, and the subject line just said "small fire in the studio," <laughs> and I actually in my head, it, I was just like, yes. <laughs> it's, all, it's all gone. No, no, more, no more storage. Yeah, no more storage problems. I'm free. I can make all new things. Never make a thing again. But 
I didn't know I was glad our studio didn't burn down but um, when I just because I started in art making ceramics and it was in a way similar to 3d printing because you're taking this very basic element like down from like mixing the clay um, and then you're transforming it and you know it yes it is expressive but it's also just a lot about learned kind of skills and mechanical skills and then you fire it and it transforms into this permanent object that like can last for thousands and thousands of years and I I got to a point where I realized like who am I to think that I should make something <laughs> to last thousands of years um, but I but I feel like very un unwilling to go there with making things with the machine even though like hearing you talk about it I don't think it is that much different from making it out of clay yeah it's it's 3d printing is super nerdy it's like super, super. I don't think it's that much different from printing a photograph digitally either oh, yeah. I think sometimes when we talk about the newest technology we get a little like retro nostalgic you know when it's it's printing still, and I don't think any of us have that kind of like feeling about three uh, about printing something digitally, like on a plotter. But I, I'm interested in this notion of lasting. What's lasting? And one word that comes up for me a lot is preciousness, or like objects being precious because I make these things that have to be cared for, and that's part of the design of the objects is that they require um, attention and they are not to be unkept or unkempt even. Um, so I think I like the idea of, of imbuing an object with a sort of like burden to put on its caretaker.